and I think I probably move forward. I'm going to change. Okay, in this uh, clinical emergency radiology book, of course, there's this list from you know uh, cat catheterization, CVL, foreign body, thoracosynthesis, lumbar puncture. Uh, for, personally, I do a, a lot of spinals with ultrasound guidance, parasynthesis, pericardiosynthesis, ultrasynthesis. Uh, of course, this list is not exhaustive, uh, but on a personal note, uh, okay, on a personal note, this is uh, my day-to-day -day work. On the left is uh, I'm trying to cannulate an artery of this uh, elderly patient which was uh, quite difficult to do it uh, in the, uh, using the landmark technique. And on the right is actually uh, the heaviest I had, 170 odd kilo gentleman who was really indicated, uh, you know, who, where central neuroaxial block was really indicated uh, a GA would probably be a high risk uh, for this patient. And in fact, uh, you know, we, were, we used a combined spinal epidural set uh, and the length of the spinal, uh, sorry, the length of the epidural tooth is actually nine centimeters. And you can see the whole length went in before I reach the epidural space. Uh, it's very, it's nearly impossible to, to feel the, the landmark. And without having uh, the ultrasound, it's probably going to be more impossible to actually perform the central neuroaxial blocking. Uh, and on the odd days, uh, this was actually a preferred patient to. Uh, to, to me uh, from the radiologist. So basically the surgeons referred to the radiologist for possible uh, thoracosynthesis, uh, pigtail insertion, and, and she was not too confident and referred to me and, and hence I had to do it. Uh, so these are the, basically the, uh, the, the procedures that uh, I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, uh, if you look at this particular article, uh, it's actually a curriculum for the performance of ultrasound guided procedures uh, under the Journal of uh, Ultrasound in Medicine. Uh, there's a whole long list. This is the things that we, you know, do we teach during the uh, during our main focus workshops and things like that. But there is actually no mention of economics, even up to uh, number uh, four here, the safety consideration, learning objectives, and so on and so forth. But I know there's actually no mention at all of economics. So this is where I thought it was probably relevant for me to touch on this subject. Okay, okay what is ergonomics? Um, it's very difficult to find the uh, uh, definition, but I managed to get this from, there is actually an International Economic Association. So basically, this the science of work, uh, a scientific discipline, of interactions among humans and other elements of a system, uh, and the, and the profession applies to theory, principles, data, and ethics. Okay, but in short, uh, technically, it's, it is actually the uh, the science of uh, basically trying to improve uh, the human work, uh, trying to how do you put it? Trying to uh, determine the uh, outside factors. The factors of the environment uh, to actually improve the work your pro work processes and to a certain degree to try to um, maintain the well-being of the operator itself. Uh, there's more to this, so basically uh, this is also still in in the website. Uh, I'm not going to go into great details because I'm going to concentrate on the physical factors, but uh, I'm just going to touch a bit on this organizational factors. You know, when you do uh, ultrasound. Sometimes uh, you can actually improve the, the, the function of the efficiency by actually improving, uh, the, for example, uh, this particular concept, which is uh, in regional anesthesia, we call it the block room. I'm not going to go into great detail of the study, but there is actually a, a room where you can set up uh, where the regional anesthesia is actually performed before the patients are being pushed to the operating theater instead of you know pushing the patient into the operating theater and then you know, the surgeons bringing down your neck, uh, uh, you know waiting for you to uh, do the uh, regional anesthesia, the regional blocks, and then waiting for the regional blocks to work and so on and so forth. Uh, this is actually a, a, a conducted a workshop in HSI. It was before COVID, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, uh, this is actually their block room uh, in the operating theater. Uh, which is quite interesting. 
because they've got the machines, uh, they've got two ultrasound systems, they've got the monitor, and of course they've got the block trolley. I think the block trolley is very important because uh, this is something that you need to consider setting up wherever you are, whether you're the emergency department, ICU, of course, OT, and so on and so forth. I'm just going to show you an example of a uh, block trolley. This is uh, something we I had um, many years ago when I was working in Singapore. So we set this up because um, it's much easier to set all this up rather than when you're performing uh, some sort of a art procedure. And then, you know, when there's no uh, a particular equipment that you want, the nurse will go and run away, and then you wait, and so on and so forth. So we set it up, and you could see that this is basically for invasive trolley, for central lines, uh, arterial cannulation, and so on and so forth. And we label uh, the, the drawers so that it's much easier to uh, assess them. We put stuff on the sides. Uh, these are basically... Uh, commercially available probe covers uh, and also uh, the cleaning solution. Um, and it's uh, the, the trolley itself can be expanded, particularly uh, when you're doing a procedure. Uh, we at that particular point we use sets. Uh, this is actually a pre bronze set uh, and, uh, with uh, the contents label. Uh, the interesting bit is things like this that you can actually uh, you know uh, there are stickers where uh, you can stick to the to the uh, containers, uh, just to highlight some of the issues. For example, uh, if you have chlorhexidine, and chlorhexidine should ideally be color coded so to, to prevent any mistakes. Uh, you know, for example, you, you tend to take a normal saline and inject through a central line, and then you know if the, if the chlorhexidine is of the same color, then that's going to be an issue. Okay, and these are drapes. Uh, for example, this particular drape I find particularly useful because uh, you don't, in, in difficult, uh, for example, central line cannulation, instead of, you know, uh, you, uh, exposing the patient every now and then, uh, the patient's, uh, the, actually the actual body habitus and the position of the patient can actually be viewed through this transparent uh, part of the uh, dressing. Okay, so let's at, look at the physical uh, uh, components, or, sorry, the components of physical ergonomics uh, in, in Block. So basically, uh, you, you can apply this to uh, ultrasound guided procedures or ultrasound guided procedures. Uh, I'm going to probably uh, dwell a bit on the ultrasound, uh, sorry, more on the ultrasound uh, equipment or the, I would say the, the brain component, uh, and then followed by uh, musculoskeletal or posture component uh, to a certain degree, uh, the new being strategy. I'm just going to quote this particular, it's a data uh, study. It's actually a published in REPM, Regional Anesthesia Pain Medicine, uh, in 2000, where they had um, three, two, two trainers, and they performed about 500 odd blocks between them, and they recorded each block, uh, and then you know, the, the, the blocks uh, or the performance were reviewed by the, uh, the trainers. And this is how they distribute, these are actually the distribution of errors. And just to highlight, uh, you know, the errors that they listed is, for example, a needle not visualized while in bars, error two, inadequate equipment preparation, needle three, neural target, malposition, unintentional probe movement, uh, output needle uh, handling, uh, and then error six, what, watching hands instead of ultrasound. And there's the error seven, which is uh, poor ergonomics. Um, if you could see that actually over uh, the period of time, there's a, the number of errors is reduced. Uh, uh, but you can see there's actually one particular trainee, trainee here who still <laughs> keep uh, uh, making a lot of mistakes uh, even as they progress through the training. You probably need about you know, uh, 30, 40 blocks to actually to be comfortable uh, and, making, uh, and by that time making less uh, number of errors. Uh, the authors defined that the poor economics was specifically defined as arcing torso, a non-dominant hand, uh, holding the needle, or uh, head turn 45 degrees or greater. Um, they've actually, uh, it's actually a, a very small uh, proportion uh, of the errors uh, falls under poor ergonomics in that particular study. Um, looking at previous data, there's actually not much data or studies conducted to actually look at performance uh, or uh, in, of uh, ultrasound guided procedures, but if you could extrapolate data from endoscopic surgery. So this is a particular study where they actually look at uh, uh, the performance. It's actually simulated uh, endoscopic surgery performance. Uh, they found out that actually uh, when there's 
the position of the operator is in one straight line, and when the gaze is actually a gaze down, uh, that is uh, the the uh, performance is uh, much better. They get more efficient in actually the performance of uh, the endoscopic surgery. So if you could extrapolate this, is technically you know you need to be in one straight line. The operator, the patient, and the ultrasound screen must be in one straight line to improve performance. Uh, I'm just going to kind of highlight a few things. So this is actually some concepts. Uh, basically, when we look at the ultrasound, we are not we are looking. Uh, there's this concept, uh, what we call uh, visual spatial processing, because we are not actually seeing uh, what is actually in front of us. So this is the important things that we, when we we have uh, uh, when we're doing this ultrasound guided procedures, is actually to minimize the mental gymnastics or say the the, the brain work that we need to do whenever we we, uh, we do such uh, procedures. So uh, I'll, I'll allude to this in the, uh, the next uh, few slides. Another co important concept is that this is for a recent review article uh, last year. Um, the imp it's important that when you handle the needle, that you the needle is actually best handled uh, on the most on the dominant hand. This is where you get uh, a bit more control. Uh, but it is more important in the right-handed individual compared to the left-handed individual. So something to remember that whenever you do uh, ultrasound guided procedures, always put the probe on the non-dominant hand and the needle in your uh, dominant hand. Uh, with regards to, as I mentioned earlier, uh, well, while we talk about ergonomics, uh, one thing is actually to improve efficiency, to improve our uh, in the success rate of uh, or whatever needle uh, guided procedures that we do. But another important component is to reduce our, um, I would say, our musculoskeletal disorder. So basically to reduce uh, occupational or to improve occupational health and safety. So uh, this is actually a study uh, where um, 5,000 uh, radio sonographers were actually interviewed and they managed to get about uh, more than half of the, more than half of the uh, the ones that inter oh, sorry, the ones that uh, were surveyed uh, to reply. So, um, so if you could look at, there are actually a significant number of uh, a lot of musculoskeletal uh, pain or discomfort uh, sonographers, um, and the top of them will be the neck pain. So, this is something important uh, for us to consider whenever we're doing this, particularly if we're doing this a day in and day out uh, uh, as a regular thing uh, during our practice. We need to consider. Uh, maintaining a certain uh, posture to actually uh, not, uh, uh, I would say, not do harm to us. These are the some of the things uh, quite interesting. Um, um, uh, basically, positions to assume. One of the things that uh, I find that sometimes we do it is actually uh, neck flexion, and, and you know, uh, as you age, uh, position is very important, and, uh, and so you need to actually consider how you position yourself uh, when you're doing these procedures. Uh, things like, for example, this articulating uh, monitor is quite interesting because in that sense, uh, you can actually move the monitor uh, without actually having to move the whole machine. And this will actually aid uh, in economics uh, while doing it yourself. So things like chairs and how you position the patient, which I would allude to, it's quite important. So it's important to, to have something uh, which is supporting your back, uh, or at least assume a neutral position, and then position in the patient in such so that you do not need to uh, uh, assume a position that's going to be stressful uh, to your uh, to your back or to the, your musculoskeletal system in short. Okay, this is uh, technically how we should position. So basically, the operator, uh, the patient, and the monitor in one uh, straight axis, in one visual axis. With regards to whether uh, you do it an out of plane and uh, in plane, so it's probably not it's immaterial. So as long as you keep that in one particular, uh, in one straight line. This is an example of, uh, this is actually a, a, a female block that my colleague is, here, is doing. And you could see that, you know, she is, uh, Dr. Yoga here is actually standing up in a neutral position, the patient and the 
the ultrasound system at the other side of the bed, and she is in one straight line. Uh, there are other, uh, uh, so basically when we are assuming uh, we're holding the probe, it's also important to not, uh, to hold the probe uh, so that there's very minimal wrist flexion, oh, sorry, it's supposed to be a wrist extension, eh? wrist flexion or wrist extension. Again, neck flexion and neck extension. So it's important to consider how you're going to position yourself, whether you're sitting up or uh, standing up. Uh, and also where you place the monitor so that there will be very minimal uh, neck movement so that you can just look straight ahead without actually uh, having to uh, assume uh, flexion or extension of the neck. Again, things like this, uh, when you move your trunk. So there, there's no, no specific data to actually uh, say that um, the performance is actually reduced when you're assuming this, but I think with experience, uh, you know, I find that whenever you are in this position where you, know, you have to move, your trunk and look uh, the other way, not to, uh, in a one straight line, actually the performance of your uh, the needle holding as well as the probe holding hand is actually diminished. And more so when you do this, uh, you know, particularly if you have a difficult procedure and you know, the, the time taken is quite prolonged, it's going to be probably uh, be quite uh, bad on your back. Um, these are some other, uh, for example, this particular arm adduction. Um, it's not recommended that you uh, uh, basically position it more than it is. But I find if you have something to rest, it's probably not too bad. And also overstretching. So particularly we do this when we do uh, echo sometimes, when overstretching. Uh, it's also important that we position uh, ourselves to actually um, uh, not actually assume that position. Kind of Okay, so just to highlight how this is actually an adductor canal block, which is actually a variant, being a variant of uh, also a more distal femur block. And again, uh, how you put it, uh, it's actually one straight line. I'm standing up. I'm trying not to actually flex uh, my neck and seeing the, uh, the, the, the uh, what do you call this, the monitor right in front. You see that I'm holding, uh, this is actually a point where the needle has been advanced, uh, but this is under the adductor canal. I'm trying to inject local anesthetic and seeing the local anesthetic spread in the adductor canal itself. So uh, these are the positions uh, you, uh, that you may want to consider whenever you're doing uh, ultrasound guided procedures. Uh, these are just some examples in, uh, in uh, this particular journal. Uh, so basically, it's important how you position the patient. Uh, so you can actually, it doesn't matter how you approach the patient, whether it's going to be on the head end or the cardiac end, as long as you can assume a position where, you know, you have some uh, a straight line and you are not, your, your wrist is probably not uh, high, uh, too extended or too flex and uh, in a comfortable position. This is an, uh, uh, the operator is actually performing an axillary nerve block. So basically the axilla is coming here, the head is there, the foot is on the other end. And this is how uh, uh, the, uh, the needle is actually advanced. Uh, and this is actually uh, a female block, um, similarly to what I showed uh, my colleague was doing earlier. So, but in this uh, particular example, that the, uh, the, the operator is actually seated. So it doesn't matter whether you're seated or you're, you're standing up, as long as you assume a neutral position so that you don't uh, you know, uh, bend forward too much or you don't uh, extend yourself as far as the back as well as the neck. Uh, I'm just going to highlight an example that uh, this is probably something that um, I did. So on the left is actually a popliteal block, and this is also a popliteal block. The difference is that this is actually a bit more lateral popliteal block. And this is actually a uh, uh, similar lateral. You can see this knee and the foot, but I'm doing it in an out of plane approach. Okay. This is a lot easier if you can position the patient like this, uh, meaning that, uh, and I'm doing, uh, and it's actually uh, quite comfortable for the patient, particularly. And the problem is that you, of course, this requires positioning. And in some patients, this may be impossible. For example, you're doing it under sedation or GAA or the patient leave. Too big for she to flip around, you know, and flip back, and for for the uh, exosurgical procedure. So, but this is something that you need to consider whenever you are uh, doing a procedure, 
uh, you, must, you must think and, and, and what is the best position for you to be in and it doesn't uh, and for and what's the best approach uh, for the leader so in this particular uh, lateral uh, popliteal uh, it's I'm approaching it. This is my needle on the lateral uh, distal uh, thigh, and coming in in uh, an in plane approach. Uh, but the problem is that you know the the fish the, the knee has to be held like this, or in, you know, some authors would recommend that you, you know, strap it up and put it, uh, or you uh, let it hang. Uh, so it depends. But what the message that I'm trying to say is that you need to kind of decide if uh, a particular procedure, how are you going to position yourself and how are you going to position the patient to actually maximize efficiency as well as maintain musculoskeletal well-being. Uh, this is something, another example that uh, I picked up over the years. Uh, so I'm doing this. This is a, a static guidance of a spinal anesthesia, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So basically what I'm trying to do is actually look at the spinal um, uh, the spine, uh, ultrasound, and uh, and decide uh, which level and so on and so forth. The problem I find, if you understand, so basically this is on the right is the uh, head of the patient and this is the, the, the leg of the patient. The problem is, because I'm right-handed, whenever, if I were to do this, so I find that my dominant hand will be uh, uh, in a more, um, I would say, uh, below, uh, compared to the, the, the left. So I would position when I'm doing a spinal, if it, this is uh, uh, static guidance. So it, it's probably a bit awkward when you, you know, you position that. But example, uh, this is actually a real time uh, spinal injection uh, that is on this end and the bottom is on the, uh, the other end. So if I were to do whatever procedures, I find that when my hand is on top, my dominant hand is on top. It's much easier for me to actually, uh, my hand will be probably a bit, a bit more dexterous and I have a bit more control. So again, this is something that you, you know, you learn over the years and, and, and decide what's, what works best. Uh, with technology, uh, this, you know, we know that we have now AI and so on and so forth and new uh, mobile uh, machines available to us. But uh, with regards to ergonomic, there's nothing much out there. Except for me, for this, this is something. Uh, this is an Epson camera. Uh, so basically, it's actually an augmented reality. So if you put this on, what happens is that you actually see the your, the screen in front of you, regardless of where the screen is or where the patient. So you are in much control. Uh, so this is uh, probably not sold as any system, but actually, uh, you can be uh, bought and attached to your system, and uh, you know you can use it uh, wherever you feel um, appropriate. I think uh, with that, I thank you. I have probably about five minutes. Thank you very much. I hand over back to uh, Dr. Zikri. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sharidan. Is there any question? Please raise your hand and unmute yourself. In the meantime, it's a great presentation. Thanks to Dr. Shah. Um, for, from what I gathered, get a good invasive trolley, mind your posture, position your equipment properly, and uh, keep everything position. in one straight line. Is that correct? Position your patient properly as well. You need to decide what position, particularly uh, uh, position of the patient. Can be the spine, can be you know, the head display, the head that way. Like, you must decide based on the ergonomics. Sure, sure. Question from the floor. This is a quiet group. That is all. Cuma nak tambah dengan yang Sharida cakap tadi lah. I think one of the most, one of the most com commonest issue when we fail a procedure is because of the position and the ergonomics. True. Yes. That's one of the one of the highest reason of failure of the procedure. Betul, Nasha. Betul, betul. I agree. So it's usually positioning uh, yourself as well as uh, the patient. So if you feel and you think you shouldn't feel, probably you need to take a break. And you 
know, when you visit, when you don't, you know, when your, your, you know, your back is not seeking as much. Uh, Adi, who can relate to this, eh, if Adi is around? <laughs> the back ache. <laughs> How about yoga? Would yoga help? Uh, yes, it's actually proven scientifically. Uh, not just yoga, any flexibility training uh, does help with a lot of the vasculoskeletal complaints as we age. But it is be somewhat unfortunate. Unfortunate because many of us who do the procedure, we have the pain, but we ignore the pain because we want yes. to fulfill the the procedure to be done. So kita ignore mm -hmm. the pain tu. Kita rasa macam, ah, biasa mm -hmm. macam tu. But actually, it shouldn't happen, right? Yeah, I think you should stop if you're feeling, you know, a very uh, discomfort or even uh, definitely pain, you should stop. And then uh, revisit, you know, you get somebody else to do it and unless, you know, it's life-threatening and, and you know, things like that. But I think you can assume, even though if it's an emergency, for example, pericardiosynthesis and whatnot, it's, uh, you know, if you start principles, uh, you know, straight back, position yourself well, you shouldn't be really actually harming yourself. Maybe if you don't do it on a day-to-day -day basis, it's probably not too bad. Uh, but I guess the, the article that I quoted, the radiographers, radiographers, the sonographers, are probably because they do it day-to-day. -day. And I think it's in some specialties, for example, pain medicine, where, you know, most of them would probably do it on a day to day, uh, do pain blocks on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think it's really probably important for them to to actually assume a good economics of the procedures. Sikri, boleh dah tamatkan session pukul satu dah. Uh, tak ada soalan ni. Alright, alright. Oh, I forgot to unmute myself. I was talking, uh, I was talking to myself just now. Okay, so um, uh, okay, on behalf of success, I would like to thank um, both presenters for great topics. Associate Prof. Dr. Sheikh Farid, as well as Dr. Sharidan. Thank you. Um, with that, I thank everyone also for your participants. So uh, let's hope we learn something today. So um, let's end our uh, online presentation with Tasbih Kafara and Surat Al Asr. Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, Allah, Alhamdulillah, Ashhadu Allah, Nasta. Al Asr, Al Asr, Al Asr, Al Asr. Assalamu alaikum and have a have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.